Welcome back to another episode of Getting the Cash Show Game with K&K. I'm jumping on here. I recorded this podcast um, earlier in the week, but look, I want to jump on here on the intro. I interviewed Tommy Thornburg from Prime Corporate Services. So Prime Corporate Services is a total game changer. If you're self-employed, you're a real estate investor, and you know you need to set up a trust or a will, these guys have simplified the process. They made it super easy, and that's why I had them on again. We've been, we refer our clients to them because honestly, Honestly, they make it easy to get an LLC, get a trust, get a will. They'll, they have experts. You can go get your taxes done with them. Um, you can jump on a call. So look, the next step here is listen to the podcast, get some great nuggets about, we talked about how to vest, LLC, what to do. But if you are looking to start an LLC, if you're looking to, how should I form an entity? What entity should I form? How should I do this? Is my CPA good? I want to get a second opinion about maybe a better CPA, or I need to, you know, put my property in a trust or do a will. These are your guys. So the link will be in the below to how to sign up, get a call with them, jump on a call, just talk to one of their experts and they will handle it from there. But jump in on this podcast, listen to it. There's a lot of good nuggets, a lot of good information that we go through that really will help you with the taxes, the vesting, the entity, the structure. Because look, a lot of people in real estate, they're not set up properly. They don't have the right entity. They don't have the right structure. They definitely do not have the right CPA advising them. And if something were to happen to them, is your trust, is your will, is it all dialed in? Is it all set up? That's why you want to go and check these guys out, get on a call, meet with them. Hey, they'll get on and jump on a free consultation call to make sure you're set up properly. Hey, if you're good to go with your CPA, you got something set up, they're going to tell you that. But if, hey, they can help you out, save money on your taxes or say, hey, I can help with the LLC or things like that. It's great. They price their LLCs really cheap. They're really fast. Um, I get set up, you know, starting a corporate LLC. So I highly recommend them. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoy this podcast. Look, like, share it, share this with somebody, somebody, maybe you're listening to this, you're a real estate agent, you're a broker, um, you're a real estate investor, your friend needs somebody that needs an LLC, they need this advice, they need the uh, expertise for this uh, podcast to them. Thanks guys, love you, talk to you soon, enjoy the podcast. Every business owner will understand this. If you spend $1,000 for a tax return, and you get a $5,000 additional refund, 5Xing your investment is an amazing business decision, right? Not only are we able to keep the cost a lot lower, but we actually track this very closely. And on average, we're able to get a 79% return back to our investors based off of the tax savings. So not only is it more competitive, it's more streamlined. What's up, brother? Good seeing you again. Thanks for coming on the pod today and excited to jump in and educate these folks on CPA, LLC, real estate planning, and get them the good facts and show them where to go to get and take care of. Love it. Thank you for having me. It's been a while. I uh, get, up, get up here to Utah. Let's hang out. I haven't seen you in a while. So thank you for having me on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just give a little bit of background and exactly, you know, who you are, what you guys do. So everybody knows, I mean, some people might have heard of you and then why you guys, you know, you're growing so fast, but why are people using your service so much? Why are you growing so much? There's a reason. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's Prime Corporate Services. We are established and we started this whole ride in 2012 and it's just been absolutely crazy. I mean, the growth that we've experienced is, I would like to think, strictly due to just helping startup entrepreneurs or early stage entrepreneurs really build and grow and develop and understand the legal and the financial side of the business. But as we've evolved over the last 12 or 13 years, we have a lot of clients that are making a lot of money and have really big businesses. So being able to provide services that Everyone really needs entities, business credit, tax, estate. There's so many areas that I feel like we're able to focus in that everyone needs to keep more money in their corner. So that's kind of the name of the game. We've got over 200 people on the tax side now and about 150 in the prime corporate side. So we're up over 300 total employees. And our goal is to empower entrepreneurs and help them understand how to protect themselves and maximize on their tax benefits. That's awesome. What do you th what what is your probably most popular service you're doing? I would say we're we're definitely most known for our entity structuring and I think that's just because that's where everyone's journey really begins. 
how to set yourself up the right way to give yourself a foundation to build and grow the empire that you're after. And everyone knows, I think, the importance of asset protection and tax savings. So even though we do other things, I think that most people know us for the entity structuring aspect between LLCs and corporations. And then another question, because in our business, we're always kind of like, you know, what's the pain point for the consumer, right? Like, what, like, where can we help them? Where can we educate them? Where can we make them not suffer as much or, you know, get over that hump or get that question answered? So what do you think your biggest pain points are with your customers coming to you? Man, I think twofold here. I think for the services that we offer and the relief that we're able to provide, that's definitely on the tax side. Being able to be confident in not overpaying in taxes is a massive pain point for everyone, not even entrepreneurs, but everyone. Taxes are something you have to deal with every single year. From a business standpoint, we've we've set up over, a, over 150,000 businesses at this point. Wow. And what I see is most common is not only in the beginning stages, but even later on, we still deal with it. And that's just shiny object syndrome. You know what I mean? It's where is your time and energy best spent? And are you really staying focused in what you're trying to accomplish? Or are you chasing every squirrel that runs across your path? So twofold, I feel like we help on the tax side a lot, but a lot of the clients that we work with that stay focused in the lane that they're after, those are the ones we see the best success. Nice. So today I kind of want to get, I want to be very tactical today because I deal with, it's a consumer, you know, real estate investors. So I'm dealing with people vested in their name, people vested in a trust, people vested in LLC. Then I'm dealing with people that, you know, are talking about estate planning and also people that, you know, might need to get business credit or how to set up something properly or what should I do, right? Because if they don't know, they're Googling it, they're looking at YouTube and they're really not sure. And then on top of that, a lot of people that I deal with, they come asking me CPA recommendations. They're not, not happy with CPAs because they feel like they're not proactive. They're not getting the right service. Or it's like, maybe they're just not a match and I outgrew them. So I know you guys focus on tax, entity setup, business credit, and estate planning. So the first one I want to jump into is the tax preparation. And I, you know, I, and I probably, when we met originally, I said, you know, how are you different? Why why are you different from them going to Joe Blow down the street or maybe the guy they're using now? If you can kind of, you know, what, how have you helped so many clients, you know? Yeah, this, this is great. The first area, if you were to interview accountants or interview CPAs, and I think what makes us really different is we have a big team of, we've got over 80 accountants now. And when we were smaller, I really liked that it stayed really niche in the beginning but now that we have more accountants and more CPAs, what I have found is we force them to collaborate and say, Kenny's saving money here. What can we do for our other clients? And it allows them to really learn from each other. There's not a lot of accountants or CPAs that have continued education, that continue to get better and bring ideas to their clients. So I think that's one. The second thing I would say is, Make sure that you have an accountant or that you ask your CPA how many tax returns or how many clients they file on an annual basis that are in your industry, real estate, for instance. If you're the only real estate client that they have and they're filing primarily personal taxes, you're leaving money on the table. So where I feel like we really have done a good job, we put focus on being proactive as opposed to being reactive. Tax planning is much different than tax filing. If you're the person that's waiting until March or April to file your return, it's too late. All you can do is put money into a retirement account and that doesn't even really help that much, right? So if people break their years up into calendar quarters, January, February, March, quarter one, so on and so forth, going into the fourth quarter, if you know your profit and your loss, you know how much you're going to have to stroke a check for come tax time. And it allows you to make decisions on either purchasing properties or investing into your business to keep more money in your corner. So I, I think changing that mindset of proactive 
is what we really try and do to empower the entrepreneurs. I agree with you 100% because there is a difference. What would you say for a typical, you know, business owner, you know, somebody you're filing their taxes, when do they start somebody that's being proactive that's really wants to make sure they maximize the tax benefit? When do you when should they really start reaching out to their CPA or when your CPA start reaching out and say, hey, let's get on a phone, let's get on a Zoom, let's get on a call, let's meet and let's start planning. Is that Q3, Q4? When do you typically do that? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, ideally, I think that if you could meet at least once a year, right? Going into the fourth quarter, I think is great. But as you grow and as you scale, that's going to become more frequent, whether it's every quarter or every month. But at the very least, I would encourage everybody, not even people that are self-employed, especially because there's so many benefits to take advantage of. But even for people that just have W-2 income, if you were to meet in the fourth quarter, going into the fourth quarter, and you know what you can do to lower your tax liability, if everyone knew that it's a use it or lose it system, I, I kind of joke about this. My mom's like, you can't choose your family. Too bad, right? You, to, a, to a certain extent, you can't choose this silent business partner in Uncle Sam. He's attached to everyone's wheelhouse, right? So understanding what that looks like and how you can lower that tax liability is a benefit to everyone, at least me going into the fourth quarter with your accountant. Yeah. The other thing I noticed too, just bringing this up, get your perspective, is that people that have the wrong CPAs not only are they not maximizing tax benefit, they're not taking advantage of a lot of things, right? Like you said, but also there's people I've had, I've gotten the tax returns, they're a single member entity. And I'm like, why are you filing an LLC return? They're like, what? I'm like, you just flows through and they didn't even know. And then, you know, I get an upset call from the CPA, what you're gonna say, why are you telling my client? I said, well, you don't need to file this. Yeah, I do. I said. I think you're just trying to make more money off of them, you know? And, and I've and I've literally had people go, you don't need to file. Why? I'm like, I've just, I've done a lot of loans. I've helped over 5,000 clients. And I have from, you know, somebody that's at the bottom of the chain to the top. So I'm like, I see everything. I'm like, that's not normal, you know? And so I think even things like that, just being overcharged or didn't even know that you shouldn't even be doing that. Like, you know, do you, do you guys see that comment of taking on things where people are like, wow, this has been just not even, not even an advantage. Just, you're just, you're just getting crushed on fees for no reason. If, if any accountants and attorneys listening to this are going to hate me for this one. Sometimes <laughs> if you were to, if you were to go, you, you ask 10 questions to 10 attorneys, you'll get 10. It depends, but, and then variations of the answer. But attorneys lean towards protecting your assets. Accountants lean towards the path of least resistance in a lot of cases on what is easiest to file the return or what is best to get an additional return. So to your point, they can charge you more money. And the reality is the truth for the entrepreneur is oftentimes somewhere in the middle. Of course, you want to protect your assets. But if it's at the expense of losing money, is that really worth it for you? And if you don't understand what the pros and cons are, you're probably not making a decision that you're overly happy with. I've got some clients that want a different LLC for every property. And I'm like, I've got other clients that'll put 10 doors, 20 doors, 100 doors in one LLC. And it really comes down to what your risk tolerance is, what your long-term goals are, and understanding what the pros and cons are. So Know that accountants and attorneys are oftentimes going to have much different opinions and it's for good reason as long as you understand what the benefits are. Do you feel because you have, I mean, I do love, I will go back to your saying originally, I do love that as a CPA firm, you know, if do you like that piece of your pie, you have 80 accountants that can sit there and talk about oh, we had this come up on, you know, maybe something new we could talk about and, and you know, kind of go back and and figure out the best solution for the client or, wow, I didn't know that we could implement this now. Do you feel because you have more in the volume, you can offer more competitive pricing for an individual? Like, I don't even know it's about pricing. I mean, sometimes for me, it's like a lot of people are looking at the pricing they're paying because they're like, I'm more looking like, what are you going to do for me rather than what are you going to save me rather than am I going to pay you? But do you feel like when you look across the board, you're like, we're actually competitive on what we're charging people to because we can be. 
Yes, 100%. And every business owner will understand this. If you spend $1,000 for a tax return and you get a $5,000 additional refund, 5Xing your investment is an amazing business decision, right? Not only are we able to keep the cost a lot lower, but we actually track this very closely. And on average, we're able to get a 79% return back to our investors based off of the tax savings. So not only is it more competitive, it's more streamlined. We put over a million dollars in the last two years strictly into technology for our tax clients to be able to expedite not only our process to keep the cost down, but also for the client to have a better experience, better login portals. Just think about you doing loans. How many people do you talk to that it takes them forever? They don't even know how to access documents that you need when they're going through that process. We've really put a lot of focus because we work with so many real estate investors on having portals and having systems that all of their information can lie. So for your clients that are working with us, you're like, oh, you're with Prime? Go log in and get me everything that you have uploaded for the tax return. And that should be what I need. So not only is it about simplicity and cost return, but building that relationship, I think is extremely valuable for the future. Yeah, it's a good point. I'd say a majority of them, if they don't have it, they got to email the CPA, they got to track them down. Then if he's out of town, they're like, great, it's holding up the deal. So, you know, totally get that. Last question on the taxes. So if somebody is not happy with their CPA or they want another opinion, or they're kind of like, I need to talk to somebody else. How does that kind of work with you guys? Meaning, let's just say they just want to say, hey, do you guys just say, hey, we'll look at your returns. We'll think, hey, somebody's doing a good job, not a good job. We get on the phone. How does that first conversation or the first couple of meetings go when somebody wants to talk to you guys and you know vet you out? The first call, we usually will do like a 45 minute to hour just analysis on where they are with their business. So are you single? Are you married? How many businesses do you have? How many doors do you have? What does your income level look like? And what does your tax liability look like? Once we end up deciding if we feel like we'll be a fit, we always want to review the previous year tax return for two reasons. Number one, we don't want to do something that's way out of the ordinary of what you've been doing previously to potentially increase audit risk. And number two, we're looking for areas of opportunity to be able to save additional money in taxes. So we've seen both sides of it, to be honest. I mean, there's some people that come to us and they say, I, I can't stand my accountant. And we're like, they're doing a good job. They missed here and there, but like, that's all you can do. We've had the opposite where it's like, what in the world is going on? And why did you not take any tax returns? Why were you not advised to run a cost segregation study? Why did you not do these things that could keep more money in your corner as an investor? So it goes both ways for sure. There's a lot of a great accountants and CPAs out there, but there's a lot that are just looking to enter the numbers, file the return. And that's where we usually see a lot of opportunity. Yeah. We call them like it's, they said, you know, like landscapers, there's like there's the mow and blow type, you know, it's like they come in, they mow and blow and they're out. And there's like the guy that's actually the landscaper. It's like, no, we do the tree. You know, we really make sure your yard looks good and it's presentable. Like, it's not like we just show up and we're out, you know, we forget about the weeds and the trimming of the trees. So I have a buddy that has a landscape company that always tells me that. Okay, cool. Let's move on. I think to one of your popular things and is the entity set up, right? If you kind of want to go through how your process works, kind of your typical pricing, I know you guys are quick. I hear good things. You're quick, you're fast, you're competitively priced. Obviously, why would somebody use you over somebody else? And then I would like to go into, I know there's this talk, do I set it up in my state? Do I go to Nevada? Do I go to Delaware? You know, and I tell people like, that's just above my pay grade. I don't even know, you know? <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, there's entity structuring is very complex and very simple, right? At the end of the day, you really have three options to set up any sort of entity. Number one, you could do it yourself. You could go to a Secretary of State website, pay the fee, get your documents and go from there. Number two would be hiring an attorney. I think that's much better because that way you get articles of incorporation and operating agreements that are actually legally prepared. Number three would be using a done with you type service. And I would say that we fall into that bucket. 
not all states are created equal when it comes to corporate law. Nevada was the hot one for years and years. They recently have kind of fallen off because they no longer have privacy and it's very expensive. Delaware and Wyoming still have additional privacy that other states don't offer. So my personal favorite is Wyoming. I actually have a holding company set up out of Wyoming. It's simple. It's easy. It's less expensive. I I joke that like if you were to send your dog across the border of Wyoming, they might come back with an LLC. It's seriously that easy. So <laughs> the the Wyoming company, a lot of times I recommend that it doesn't even do any business, but it owns your other businesses. So if you're in California, the Wyoming company can own the California company. And if the California company gets sued, now they don't see that Kenny's the owner and your address where your girls are sleeping, right? You want them to be able to see that it's Wyoming so that they don't see your name. That's the benefit of Wyoming in general. It's, it's strictly for additional privacy, which then provides additional protection. Wyoming's my favorite, but making sure you're set up properly. LLCs, S-Corps are great for active income, but it's not one size fits all. Everyone's situation really does vary. And that's where we try and get specific to help everyone understand why. What is the cost to set up entities? Do you have that off the top of your head or? Every state's a little bit different. You're usually sure. going to be looking three to $600 based off of the state fees. But we have really discounted everything down. We're doing three to 5,000 entities a month. So wow. we've really streamlined. We've got an amazing team. Not only do we pay the state and the filing fees, we get the EIN. We get the articles of incorporation. We give you a custom operating agreement. And we even go as far now as giving you banking resolution documents, banking recommendations. We've really turned that into a turnkey service that gives you everything you need in one composed email. So three to $600 though, to answer your question. That's great. And then how long does it typically take? I mean, is it state by state? It's all different, I'm guessing. Yeah, a lot of them we can turn around next day or our wow. average right our average right now is a 4-day turnaround time, but there are a couple states that take about 2 weeks. So, usually it's anywhere from next day to 2 or 3 weeks tops. Our average, we track that very closely for that team. Our average right now is like 4 and a half days to get that back to the to the investor. And what California is it 2 weeks? California is currently 2 weeks. Florida takes about 2 weeks. Some of the big states that we do a lot of volume in are hurting our four and a half number, but a lot of states are one to three days. So just depending on the state, that's kind of what it looks like. And, and that's where we also help people understand that as a real estate investor, having an extra entity isn't always the worst thing in the world. Because if you come across an opportunity and you have an LLC that's sitting stagnant, now you can utilize that without having to wait two weeks and feel like you're Russian. But California, you've got an $800 a year fee for them to charge you for the weather to make sure your weather's beautiful, I think is what that's for. So every, <laughs> every state, you got to be very aware of what those fees are. And we like to just break everything down for you. Yeah, I agree. With I, I do agree. If you are an active investor, why not have another LLC just ready to go? Because if you get in a deal and you need it, I have guys getting in deals and getting it and they're so rushed to get, it's like here, it's just stressful, you know? Yep. All, all the sure. time. The other one I was interested to talk to you about too was the business credit, kind of how that works, how you're helping businesses and kind of going a little bit more about that. Yeah, I, I've never met an entrepreneur that says, I wish I had less money. That is my <laughs> that is my go-to saying for business credit at all times. and. I, I mean that very serious. So just to give everyone a visual for li for whoever's listening, you have a legal name, a social security number, and a personal FICO credit score, right? We want to help you do the same thing for the business. Get a business name, get your EIN, build and develop a PayDex score. It's P-A-Y-D-E-X. It's a credit profile for the business. As you build up your credit profile, there's just additional funding options. So you've got small business loans. You've got credit line hybrids or credit stacking, and that's where you are utilizing your personal credit to get a bunch of credit cards. It's not my favorite, 
But if you need money quick, it's a great option, especially if you're in a fix and flip and you're tight on cash, right? But what we really focus on and what we do here is trade vendor credits. And what that means is we break it up into three phases. Phase one is getting these starter accounts like Uline, Granger, buy your toilet paper, buy your paper towels off of these accounts. And then you'll build up your credit profile to get major credit cards and eventually get lines of credit. I've been building my credit for about eight years. And six months ago, I had an opportunity to buy eight acres and two mobile homes in Missouri. My cousin's been property managing some, some, we've been buying a bunch of properties in Missouri and he's been managing them. It's been kind of fun, but it would have been an 8% rate on the investment property. So I actually just used a business line of credit, 150,000 at 4% and saved me four points, allows me to cash flow, having additional money. Even if you don't know what you're going to use it for down the road, it's going to benefit you at some point. I have a hard time thinking otherwise. Well, wow, that's pretty good. What? So when, when you do business line of credit, do you have typical, like the minimum, the maximum you can go, some rate ranges, anything like that? I mean, all kinds of terms, but you have some basic ranges. Yeah. Usually, I mean, you can go, you can get as quick as, you know, $2,000, $5,000 on the low end, but we have clients that'll get upwards of $100,000 within three to six months or $100,000 on that credit line, credit stacking opportunity. It totally varies based off of credit score and income, but there's opportunities all over the place. And the reality is we've been working on this for the past few months. You know, we always want to bring as much value as we possibly can. And our partner, Prime Corporate Services, is all about bringing you a service you can't get anywhere else at a price you can't get anywhere else. Whether you're new to owning a business or owning a property or you're an experienced property owner or investor, Prime Corporate Services is not only going to help you, but they're going to make the process so much easier. So if you book a call, the first thing they're going to do for you is help you understand what your business structure should look like. Your corporate structure structure, tax planning, estate planning, all of that. Maybe you're saying, I'm brand new to starting a business and all this sounds foreign and complicated. Remember, this company helps new people just getting started every day. They're going to help you form the entity that's best for you and walk you through the process. Before I found this company, we paid thousands of dollars to other attorneys, CPAs, and consultants to try to understand exactly how we need to be structured to be as protected as possible. We've also gone the other route and used online platforms to form entities which unnecessarily put us at risk. You guys, you don't have to do that with this company. They'll do all of these things for you at a reasonable price so you never have to think about saving money at the expense of exposing yourself to liability. We search high and low and you will not find this much value anywhere else. All you have to do is schedule a free call today. Just go to primecorporateservices.info slash G-I-T-C-G. Once again, that's primecorporateservices.info slash G-I-T-C-G. We'll also leave the info for you in the show notes. Statistically, self-employed people make more money than employed people. So a lot of times credit lines are higher and interest rates are lower. All of my business lines of credit are much larger than my personal line of credits for that reason. So even if you don't get what you want initially, long-term, it's it's always a good idea to keep building those rates up. No, I, I agree. I agree. That's awesome. That's cool. You guys are doing that. And then the final piece, which I think for a lot of people, this is really what I want to dig into a little bit is the estate planning. I think there's a lot of confusion around out there. A lot of people don't know because look, when you buy a primary residence, you could put it in, you could put an LLC, you could put it in a trust, you could put a joint tenants, tenants in common. You know, there's this whole list of stuff and people don't know if they're protected. And then you've heard stories where somebody died and it wasn't in a trust. And then it goes to, you know, the courts, and this whole nightmare, right? And so I think there's just a lot of confusion and a lot of noise because you can go on the internet and hear 10 different opinions. What are, and this is obviously, I think, a big thing for a lot of people that estate planning. So in this estate planning, you know, we'll call it that, what are you guys focusing on with your clients and people that come in the door to help them out with? Yeah, estate planning is something that I truly believe everyone should have. And the problem with that is I think for whatever reason, a lot of people think that estate planning, trust, wills are just for rich people. But that's not the case. If you have a bank account, if you have a retirement account, if you have a house, even if you have a car, having an estate plan is very beneficial. So when we do estate plans, we do all four components, trust, will, living will, power of attorney. And the most important part is having a trust. Because to your point, the goal is to avoid probate. 
and ask your parents, ask your grandparents, do you have a trust? Because not only is it a financial strain, if the courts step in and you have to pay for probate, <laughs> but it's it creates so much emotional damage. I know so many people that don't talk to siblings or friends or family because of this probate process, and it's totally unnecessary if the proper instruments are in place. So trusts are number one, most important to avoid probate. And I would say wills go hand in hand and they really speak together. But the living will is also, what are your intentions? I, It's not the fun stuff to talk about, but you want to put put on life support or pull the plug. You know, it's it's not dinner time conversation by any means, but once it's done, it's done. Yeah. Um, and then also the power of attorney. Who do you trust to make decisions for you in a worst case scenario, both from a financial and a health aspect as well? So the estate plan is one of the most important parts that we offer, and we've seen it help a lot of people. There's no doubt. Yeah, for sure. And then you know the other thing with the probate is. I've had clients that they didn't realize how long it was going to take. It can take a while. So they were expecting an effusion of cash. And then they realized, wait a minute, it's going to take longer. And they couldn't even get money out of that to pay attorneys. And it's just, it's just ruined their lives. And then siblings are fighting and this like I said, it's emotional, it's draining. People that don't understand, they say, wait a minute, I thought mom died. We just sell the house and we get the money. What do you mean it's going to take a year? To, what, I don't understand this. What are, what are we talking about here? With that being said, when it comes to trust, I don't know if you can speak on this because maybe you know, you're know you not a trust attorney and I'm sure you have people, but maybe generally, what have you found that if you're going to do a trust, what are probably some of the most important things in a trust that we should be thinking about to put in there or not to put in there or... Yeah, I've I've got a couple of state plan attorneys right downstairs. I could go grab them, but I'll just tell you what they'll say here. So when you're setting up your trust, a lot of times we're looking for bank accounts or cash, securities, bonds, any sort of stocks, real estate, life insurance. A lot of times our clients as well, you asked me this earlier, I forgot to answer this, but your primary home, a lot of times you put into your living trust and that's a great place to be able to still have that additional protection and the peace of mind of giving that where that goes. So if you think about it this way, a trust is where you put the assets. A will is where you direct who you want those assets to go. So the will can not only have your kids, who you want to be able to get these assets, but you can also put, I mean, we've seen prized possessions, right? Like grandfather clocks, watches, jewelry, things like that, that still have value. We had a, we had a, one of our estate plan attorneys, he was in this like super long probate process where everyone was arguing over one of those old school station wagons. And it's things like <laughs> that, that you would put into the will and who you want to get them. The trust is more actual firm assets. And then when I think a good question for people, let's say you have a trust, you got a trust with you guys, you acquire another property you maybe get additional accounts, bank accounts or whatever. Should you be adding that to the trust as you go along? Like what is the recommendation there? Yeah, great question. It kind of depends on how you're structured. So I'll just use myself as the example. When I'm buying new properties, if they're in LLCs, I already have those LLCs tied together with the trust and the will so that I don't have to update it every time I buy a new property. But if you don't have those things in place, then in theory, yes, you should add them. But I think that's another benefit of having these LLCs in place is if the properties are tied to the LLCs, that way you can tie the LLC together. And if something happens, it all funnels up into the trust and the will. Does LLC and a trust, do they have, from a liability standpoint, if you put an investor property in a trust, you guys would recommend put that investment property in LLC. It's better for protection. Is that the recommendation you guys would give? You know, not necessarily protection, but the reason okay. that I love LLCs is because it still provides flexibility. If you put all of your properties into a trust and you're looking to cash flow off of them, trusts are taxed at the highest rate. If it's over $14,000 and some change, you're taxed at the highest rate. Where with LLCs, you can write off expenses. You can run cost sags. You can lower your tax liability much greater. They are both great instruments from a protection standpoint, but LLCs are flexible. They're easy. 
And it really is a great benefit to lower your overall tax liability. That's 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 awesome. And then what is a typical trust, a will, a kind of cost for general for you guys to set up? How long does it take? If you know somebody has to get something done quick, can it be quick? Is it as long as it to get the information to you guys? Yeah. So cost wise, I mean, we're two to five thousand dollars, which ask estate plan attorneys. It's it's tough to get that. My uncle is an estate plan attorney in California and he doesn't do estate plans for less than $30,000. He's like, why don't you send wow. me more business? I'm like, dude, come on. So a lot of people will charge. <laughs> off. Like, what, what do you want me to do here? Bring your cost down. A, a lot of estate plan attorneys will charge off of overall net worth and assets. And that can become very expensive. When we have partners like yourself, when people come through and say they're working with Kenny, we, we have a $3,000 option with unlimited changes, unlimited amendments. You can't beat it. If someone gets you an estate plan for $500 tomorrow, they're going to charge you every time you want to make a change down the road. So just be aware of that. But usually the turnaround time, we see on average two to three months just to get all the information uploaded and filed and submitted with the state and signed. But it does come back to getting the information and filling out the form. So it's two to three months on average. Okay, cool. And then anything that maybe we did not discuss today, questions that you guys might get a lot that are common things that people need to know. Any any anything you want to kind of share? Cause there might be some stuff out of here that I I just went over the bullet points that you know. Like I said, we kind of went over the pain points, what you kind of their popular service you guys do, went through all the big items you do. Anything else? Yeah. I mean, just one last thing. This It's fresh on my mind because I talked to our team of accountants about it yesterday. We're really trying to put together information on why people save more money on taxes than others. And the most simple $9,000 savings that we found was just tracking expenses. So we have a full team of bookkeepers. We have a lot of bookkeeping clients. And there's the most common problem that we find for entrepreneurship when it comes to taxes is that people just don't track what they're spending money on. And it's important because you don't re you don't remember what you had for lunch last Tuesday, right? You're not going to remember if it was business related a month from now. So if you get in the habit of tracking your expenses throughout the course of the year and you have that strategy on a quarterly or even once a year basis, not only will you write off your standard deductions, but then you can get creative. You can pay your kids and get the write off there. You can rent out your house and operate the Augusta rule. You can buy another house and create more cash flow and depreciate it. Knowledge is power and having the knowledge of what your profit and loss is is the number one savings that we've noticed over the last couple of years. So that'd be the final thing that I would say, whether it's an Excel spreadsheet, QuickBooks, one of these cool tax apps that they have now, track your expenses. Don't let it get away from you. I just had a couple, two more questions. I'll leave the one for last. The other one I was going to ask is, well, let me ask the other one because I forgot the other one. But there's, I heard today on CNBC in the next 20 to 30 years, there's going to be $73 trillion transferred in wealth. That's a lot of wealth. Wow. I haven't heard um, that, but I, that's crazy. Yep. So a lot of those people that have you know, a lot of money, billionaire, hundred millionaire down, they obviously have trust and you know, the whole thing set up. Do you guys, if somebody is like, Hey, I've got a real estate portfolio I built, I've maybe got a trust and all C's, but I'm like, I don't really know how I'm going to hand this down to my kids. I don't really know the game plan. I don't even know. I've got to trust, but is this set up for the best tax advantages for them? And I know it could change because certain administrations can come in or leave, right? But outside of politics and that, it's actually, I was, we were throwing an event and somebody asked me that I know personally that has a good real estate holding. And I was like, yeah, like I haven't been asked that kind of like, yeah, there's a, he's set up, but he's like, how do I know if I die today? Like that transfer is, am I, am I, am I giving the best tax in this? Is that something you guys talk about there? You work on, are you being pushed in to, to solve these issues or problems? Yes, 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 yes. It's so, 
It's so important. Not only is it important to not to have one person, but multiple people. So I just, a lot of the analogy that I use is what if you were to go down in a plane crash with your whole family or with just your significant other, having one, two, three, four, and five options is extremely important. Another thing that we do is you have the ability to put stipulations in there. So if something was to happen to you and your children are still young, what do you want from them to be able to still provide the message that you truly would have provided if you were still there? So for instance, do you want them to have to graduate college? Do you want them to have to start a business? Do you want them to be able to, to, to have to pass a drug test? We've seen all sorts of different things, religious things. There's all sorts of areas that you can get as granular and as specific as you really want. But I think what's most important is knowing who it's going to and having those layers of options so that it goes directly to where you choose. But absolutely, that's part of the process. When you're filling out the form, we're asking you questions like that on anything special. We also, we've got an attorney with a special needs son and he does amazing special needs trusts where the money is broken up over a longer period of time cool. to make sure that there's proper care because he's going to need care for the rest of his life. So even when he's 40, 50, 60 years old, that money needs to stretch for that period of time. It can't just all be dumped on him at once. So all sorts of situations, everyone's situation is different. We've never done one estate plan that's the exact same two estate plans that are the exact same. But yes, we go into all that information when we're structuring those. Great. And then my last my last question, I remember you kind of oh, we kind of opened up with it and, and maybe you guys have some good debates over there between attorneys and CPAs is I mean, I would like to get your opinion is it's, it's a, I'm, I know this topic would be debated because there's always different sizes. Do you put if you have five properties you put it in one LLC or do you get five LLCs and in and I had, the reason I ask is, so one of my brother's best friends in Florida, he's an injury attorney and he dealt, he was, he won the most money for the single attorney on the condo collapse in Florida. So he's a part oh, of that wow. case. And so he came on the podcast and I said, all right, somebody falls on my property and you're, you're coming after me. And I know you're one of the best. Am I protected? And I'll see, he said, yes. And I said, well, what if I have my properties all in one LLC. He goes, well, then I can go after those other LLC. And he, his comment was, get separate LLCs. Don't be cheap because if something happens, you're going to be like, I would have been glad to pay that $1,200. So that was his take from an attorney standpoint. But I would like to hear, I know you guys have some debating because it's always, what, what's your take? Tell him thanks a lot. I've heard that that deal single-handedly increased insurance premiums. I've, I've heard that. That's crazy. Is that, have you heard that as well? Yeah. So let me tell you why. I'll tell you why real quick for you answer. So why that is, is the the building collapsed. And the funny thing is, I'll tell you about that. Like the building collapsed. They actually, he it's on the podcast. So I could talk about it. He's like, we showed up in court and the judge called everybody and every attorney. There's 17 attorneys working on it. He called everybody in and said, all right, we're going to get through this trial in like a year. They're like, there's no trials that are going to be that big or a year, like 10 years, right? And he also said, so if you're here in this room and you think you're going on vacation, you're not in, he goes, walk out the door now because it's not going to happen. I want you here. I want you committed. And not only did they get through that, I think in a year, year and a half and paid out the billion or so dollars, they also, the attorneys did not get much money, by the way. It was kind of like they got paid, but for what they, what they could have, it was not much. But so the judge did the right thing, made it fast. So that was the good thing. The bad thing is what you're talking about is the collapse, the deaths, and then the insurance debacle. And what happened is, is when that collapsed, lenders, especially Fannie and Freddie, who are the big lenders, they went and said, wait a second here. We have this HOA cert that you fill out, right? Is this, is the repairs maintenance? And so in Florida, I heard that every HOA got hit up by the government saying, we need to know you're sound and safe. So engineers. So what happened is, is everybody went into, oh my gosh, this collapse. What if this collapse? What if that collapse? The cost of insurance is going to go through the roof. So we're not only is it harder to get lending, 
not only did the insurance go up, but I'll give you one scenario here in California, San Diego, that it did. And so why it's going up is because of that. And now they realize if something collapsed, how much they had to pay out, can we even afford it? So here, there's a lender, this guy's on the HOA, who's all the HOAs? He's the president of an HOA. And he says, I live, Kenny, and there's 160 condos. I go, okay. He goes, we got insurance in 2022 for the whole community is $55,000. He goes, great. What do you think my renewal for 2023 was? I was like, I have no idea. He said, take a guess. I said, 250,000. He goes, no, try a million dollars. Jeez. So he says, not only is that the problem, the bigger problem is he goes, we can't even afford it. So now we're actually insured, but we're underinsured. And I go, what does that mean? He goes, well, basically if something bad happens, we might not be able to do what we need to do and have enough money. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. I've even heard like in California and these major states, there's insurance companies that are pulling out of homeowners insurance for that same reason. It's just too expensive. That's a lot of problems kind of here. A scary thought. Yep. And and what that what that's from is, you know, unfortunately you're going to get this because you're a business owner and you deal with rising costs across the board. We all are, right? So the flood, the earthquake, you know, whatever happened to fix that problem used to cost X, now it costs Y. And so in here, like Florida and California, like they already negotiate where you cannot raise the insurance or is that whole kind of, I don't know the whole logistics, but basically the insurance companies are coming out saying, we have all these claims, we're losing money. Why would we be in business if we're losing money? We'll just get out of here until you change your policy. So one of it, I guess, is at the policy level, but for protecting the consumers so we don't get gouged, but they're also like, now we have insurance companies leaving. Now we are getting gouged because we can't get competitive insurance. So you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. So it's, 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 it's tough. Yeah, it's crazy. Well, to answer your question about how many properties in one LLC. <laughs> there we go. Attorneys sell LLCs. They're going to tell you one per. I don't necessarily disagree with it, but remember my comment earlier, that is very asset protection. That is, that is what that is, is separating those out. The accountant's going to tell you, eh, put a, put a hundred of them in an LLC. I don't care. It's less work for me. So I'm, st I'm still going to charge you per door on the taxes. I don't care. I'm still going to get the money out of you. So here's what I would say from an entrepreneurial standpoint. Number one, you really need to be aware of what your risk tolerance is. If you are extremely conservative, do a different LLC for every property. The second thing that I would say is making sure that you are properly insured. I have one LLC and I currently have 12 doors in it. I, I, I wouldn't have liked to have that many doors in it, but they're lower value properties and the insurance, the properties are probably worth 1.5 or so. And I have insurance for two and a half million. So if you're properly insured, I would like to think that that helps from a peace of mind standpoint. And then number three is just, what is the overall equity or property value? I care a lot more about $500,000 of equity than I do $5,000 of equity, right? So I, I think the hardest part about that question is there is no one right answer. But if you have one door or if you have five doors, you're going to want to probably separate them out a little bit more. Once you have a hundred doors, you don't want a hundred LLCs. So based off of what your overall net worth is, the insurance premiums, insurance starts to get pretty expensive over $5 million. So that's when I'll usually start separating them out to get additional policies and lower that monthly income. But yeah, there's, there's no one right answer. And just know that attorney's going to say what you said, accountant's going to say the opposite, but as long as you're properly insured and you're aware of what your risk tolerances are, I think that's what's most important. Well, I, I like the answer. I mean, there you go, guys. It's it's not it's 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 your own risk, like you said at the beginning. It's what your risk tolerance is, and you're going to get a lot of different answers from different people. Um, Tommy, I really appreciate the time. If somebody wants to learn more about you, where's the best way to find you? I'll also put a link in the description of this. My link, you can go there, you know, book a call with these guys. It, it's really helpful. They're very transparent. They're very easy to get a hold of and they can help you out. But, you know, how to learn more about you and anything else you want to leave us with? Yeah, we'll make sure to get you a link so that it ties it together. We know you're a real estate investor and it's a free hour consultation. So, 
take advantage of it. Speak with our team. Let them know if you need entity, business credit, tax, estate. Get get the most out of that call. That call is obviously for you. As far as I'm concerned, it's everything prime corporate services, Instagram, Facebook, everything else. I've got a personal Tom Thornburg, but you don't want to see my ugly mug. You might as well follow prime corporate so we can give you tax tips and keep money in your corner. So thank you for having me. It's great seeing you and hopefully you get in Utah soon so we can hang out. For sure. Awesome. Well, Tommy, I really appreciate it. And I think I learned some stuff today and I know a lot of people I keep getting hit up on these questions. So I'm glad I can get you on, get them over there for CPA services or get the LLC set up. And I know you guys do a good job and do it fast and do, you know, you really watch and try to make it affordable in a world where a lot of stuff isn't affordable. Very true. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Awesome. All right. That's a wrap. Cool, dude. Thank you. I appreciate you. Yeah. I'll, you know what? I've, I'm, I'll be up there. I'll give you a text. If you're around, you're around, but I'll be up there in a couple weeks. Cool. Sounds good. Have, have fun, man. It'll be awesome up in Park City. Enjoy yourself. I will. Good seeing you. I appreciate the time. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. If you're already a real estate investor, you know that aside from cash flow, you also get huge tax benefits by investing in real estate. But are you taking full advantage of all the potential tax benefits? We've been working with Tim Looney at CSSI for a few years now, and he's saved us and our clients hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in taxes doing cost segregation studies on their properties. Let me give you a few examples. We bought a property in 2019. If we had just used straight line depreciation, we would have saved about $18,750 in taxes. But because we did a cost set, we save $258,000. That's $239,350 more than standard straight line depreciation in the first year. The other great thing is if you're classified as a real estate professional, you can apply this to other sources of income like W-2 or 1099 income. And you can also roll over any unused depreciation to future years. If you've owned your properties for a few years already, don't worry. You can still do a cost seg and save big on your taxes. This is not tax advice. So consult your CPA to see if you qualify to take advantage of these benefits. Call or text him at 318-469-9861 to get your complimentary property analysis. Once again, that's 318-469-9861. And I'll also include his information in the show notes. You guys don't want to miss out on these tax savings.